The Mitchell's Front Page Podcast is brought to you by Geelong Bank. Listen live on 94.7 The Pulse, Mondays and Tuesdays from 9 to 11. Federal Independent Candidate for Karangamite, Tom Rowe is on the line. Tom, good morning. Thanks for being on the program once again. Morning, Mitch. Great to be back on the program. Hello to your listeners. Whilst I'm still sitting in my car, you were not in the studio. I long line through a very long, dark tunnel, we can see some light at the end. So I think that's very good news to start off the week. Yeah, well, there's hope. And I think the big thing for potentially us having people back into the studio is I think from 80% doubly vaxxed, the density quotient for officers' workplaces goes down from uh, one person per four square metre to one person per two square metres, provided everyone is fully vaccinated. So a few things to work through, but hopefully we can have more studio guests in the future because it's actually quite a big part of this program. Yeah, well, look, absolutely, Mitchell, and this all goes to the heart of the the plan and stepping out of this disaster we've all been experiencing, but most particularly small business. Uh, And I think I just heard some quotes on Virginia's program this morning, one particular small business owner talking about nearly 300 days of lockdown and not being able to operate as a business. So whilst we'll have some societal-wide freedoms, and that's terrific, more recreation, mixing of people, getting into people's homes, We've got to have a state government that becomes braver and braver to uh, open up business. And whether that's business in the you know, Geelong region, of course, as well as particularly the Melbourne CBD and the Geelong CBD. We've just got to try to get business opening up again in addition to personal freedoms. Now, I was reading your opinion piece. You're not very happy about the situation around the swimming pools because you suggest that swimming pools shouldn't be a federal issue. And yet you've got the two major parties, the Liberal Party and the Labor Party, both talking about swimming pools on the ballerine as a big ticket item as part of their political campaigns. Well, indeed, and as as you've just sort of indicated, what have pools got to do with the Commonwealth or federal government of the day? And in one word, nothing. That's unless you're into pork or uh, or vote buying. Now, we've got two sort of pool fiascos going on at the moment, uh, Mitchell. We've got uh, both the, the Northern Aquatic and Community Hub, which is this what was called the Northern Ark and this complex out at uh, Northern Way, which has been, I think, the number one priority project, the G21 and I think Geelong Council for many years now. And there's been a whole, you know, long dance, uh, sorry, dance in many respects on funding. Now, back, I think, in uh, May, June, our council resolved to step up um, and f- make a further substantial funding commitment. Originally, it was going to be $60-odd million for the whole complex, 20 from council, 20 from the state government, 20 million from the federal government. That's up broadly to the, to the $60 million. And John Council had committed broadly to that one-third, a bit more, I think about $23, $24 million. And they wanted the state and federal governments to step up. The state stepped up and there's been sort of suggested promises indications that the federal government would step up as well. So back May, June, uh, council steps up and says, look, uh, under this current, I think it's Better Regions... Um, um, building Better Regions buying, Fund? Better Building Fund, exactly, this vote-buying scheme out of the feds. Um, uh, we've got to fully commit because unless we're committed to the project and it's funded, we can't draw down against this particular uh, federal fund. So our council stepped up and committed to I think what I think Eddie likes it, Eddie Contell said, as one of our councillors said, an eye watering debt and we've basically got to roll the dice and we're gambling, uh, in effect. Now, he didn't say those words. Other councillors were spoke to it and uh, as well. But in effect, council rolled the dice and gambled with our money. Um, and as it turns out, we haven't got an approval for to draw down against that better regions um, building fund. And so now this 43 odd million dollars of committed funding from the uh, from our council, we're stuck with. And and this goes to, I think, the core of the problems and issues that we see and how we fund our community infrastructure all over the place. That uh, that particular aquatic centre sits in the seat of Corio, which Richard Miles' seat. It's a safe labour seat uh, and it simply doesn't attract the level of focus from our governments that a seat like Corangamite uh, attracts. And so it's missed out yet again on this federal funding arrangement. Uh, our council, and therefore we the people, are stuck with an eye-watering debt. I think that were the u- words used by Councillor Contell uh, back when council resolved to for roll the dice here. Um, and um, uh, yet at the same time, we've got all sorts of hand-waving for this pool that's being promised 
um, in part funded and part not, uh, or the northern side of the Bellarine. I think it's otherwise called the, uh, the North Bellarine uh, uh, Aquatic Centre. Uh, and we've got some funding from the Commonwealth, five million, oh, sorry, $10 million from, from a promise from Sarah Henderson. We've got $5 million uh, from Council again. And now we've got Libby Coke, who stepped into the fray, um, hand-waving about a further $20 million to create uh, an indoor uh, uh, complex as distinct from the outdoor pool that's currently being promised. Uh, this issue of of pork and vote buying is like, as I've described previously, an insidious cancer. And we've just got to do something to uh, clear this out because it infects so much of what we do in our society. And whether that's sports rorts or car park rorts uh, and now this latest pool fiasco, uh, we've got to try and sort this. And we're not going to be able to sort this properly unless I think we politically organise ourselves in a way and ultimately, and the the last point in that article, or rather the beginning point of that article, was that this region forms ultimately its own state and begins to deal directly with the federal government for our funding needs. So that region that you talked about, which then made it into the Geelong Advertiser, it said in the Geelong Advertiser, Western Victoria, is that the state region of Western Victoria or is that a different part of Western Victoria that excludes Kerangamite? Where exactly would you draw the boundaries? Well, well, well my boundary is... Uh, Karayo, Karangamite and Wadden. I see. Right, they're the three federal seats that, in my view, make up Western Victoria or West Victoria was the sort of label that I put out there as a label for a new state. Uh, and you might look further, a little bit further north and, and Ballarat. Think north and think about Ballarat as well, but sort of not sure. My broader view is that we need to decentralise and create more autonomous state bodies like we have at the moment. Our federal constitution was always set up with, and, and was contemplated that we'd have more states created uh, since 1900 and one, which when, when we federated, uh, how many states have been created? Zero. Uh, if you look at the United States of America, uh, since about 1900, they've created about five states. So, so unfortunately, this has been our journey to date, and it's wrong. And, and we've had this incredible wave of centralisation into Canberra and to a lesser extent Spring Street. Uh, and so the states suffer as a result, and of course the regions suffer as a result uh, through, through vote buying and the, and the politics of pork. So this new autonomous state of Western Victoria or autonomous region, uh, yes. would it have, it have its own parliament? Where would that sit? How yes. would that work? And actually, well, actually, do we have the talent to have another X number of parliamentarians representing that particular area? Uh, of, of course we have the talent um, and uh, within this region. So we're talking about a regional population today of about 350,000 people, but we need to be bigger. I mean, there's no doubt there's a journey here and you can't do it today or tomorrow, but in, 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 tomorrow, in, in tomorrow year or decade, we need to step ourselves up to that particular end game and we do need to be bigger. So can we do it within our own region right now and have our own parliament? Absolutely. And if you look at the cantons of Switzerland, and I'll remind everybody that when we formed our constitution, we drew heavily from the Swiss constitution. Um, uh, there are cantons in Switzerland, self-governing autonomous bodies, just like our states here, that are a fraction of the size of the city of Greater Geelong, 20 or 30,000 people. Now, that's too small in my view, and you need to be some hundreds of thousands and probably, in my view, uh, a regional population of circa a million people. Can we do it today? Absolutely, from our talent pool. But ideally, we'd be bigger. We'd be bigger for a whole bundle of reasons, including having critical criticality of employment and an appropriate revenue base coming from uh, people, uh, domestic consumption, um, and, uh, and our business community. So we're not there today, I think, but we have to have the vision to take us there. And for that, we need to be bigger. And the way that um, our current system of government, uh, our fiscal system, whereby the Commonwealth takes far too much money for its constitutional responsibilities, we call that vertical fiscal imbalance, and then it dishes it out basically to buy votes through the Commonwealth, and we call this horizontal fiscal equalisation, um, it distorts so much through our society, through our Commonwealth. And this creates all sorts of problems. It's killed, I think, uh, microeconomic reform, taxation reform. You've got the new Premier of New South Wales, um, um, Mr Perrottet, uh, who's been trying to get up a new 
land tax versus stamp duty regime up there. Uh, that's particularly visionary and something that many people like me have been promoting for some time. But even he's becoming unstuck up there and hasn't got it through uh, through his parliament because there's resistance up there. It is very, very hard to introduce uh, microeconomic reforms in this country because of the way that the what we call the Commonwealth Grants Commission operates and the way it penalises success. At the moment, Victoria and New South Wales are penalised for their success and those failed states like South Australia in particular are rewarded for their failure. And they take money from Victoria and therefore money from our community and the infrastructure that we need for growth and they give it away to South Australia. Uh, or for that matter, Western Australia and Queensland and Tasmania and of course the Northern Territory. Northern Territory, different case, I think. And you can run arguments around that. But the South Australian example for us is the worst of all. And it's destroying, I think, the growth uh, story uh, for Victoria. Uh, as we know, and you and I have discussed already, the amount of politics there is in this region alone, stemming from Stephanie Asher as the candidate for the Liberals, uh, or Libby Coker, or the other state parliamentarians, all talking about this anti-growth agenda and trying to lock up Karangamite from further growth. But of course, if you don't have the money going into infrastructure delivery, what else would you expect than the people saying no more growth? Because all they see are problems and no dividend. Uh, and, and we've got to change this because at the moment, $85 billion has been ripped out of Victoria since about 1942. It's been used to buy votes elsewhere in the Commonwealth. And we've got to change the system, Mitchell. Uh, if you have this region or state of Western Victoria, what's the guarantee that you wouldn't have marginal seats in it and then you're sort of back to square one? Because clearly they're talking a lot about swimming pools and development because that's what's resonating with the voters. They're doing their own focus groups and surveys and finding out that they're the issues that obviously get people listening. Well, you've just got to stop the capacity for the Commonwealth to dish out money. So you can still have a marginal seat but the Commonwealth can't dish out money to buy votes. So we've got to change the system. Now, you can do that by saying to the Commonwealth, well, you can't take the money from the states any longer, one. Or, secondly, you could say what money you do have in excess of your constitutional responsibilities, you can only dish it out on a per capita basis. And, in fact, if you look at Section 99 of our Constitution, uh, and it's headed Commonwealth not to give preference, and it says the Commonwealth shall not, by any law or revenue give preference to one state or any part thereof or another state or any part thereof. So how we divvy up the current Commonwealth funding plan the way they do it, we do at the moment under horizontal fiscal equalisation, I think is unlawful. But you might be able to run the argument, understandably, because we are a federation and we need to have a bit of sharing, that on a per capita basis, you dish it out. But that's it. So... Um, and the Commonwealth can only deal with the state government of the day, because again, under Section 96 of our Constitution, under these funding arrangements, the Commonwealth should only deal with the state government or a state as it's defined, not with the council authority. So these funding arrangements with councils have to come to an end. So if you dish out the money on a per capita basis and our region becomes bigger, we attract more money. And you have marginal seats and you have and obviously the politics associated with the marginal seat, but the vote buying, the politics of pork, that comes to an end. Well, it's an interesting proposal. Have you had much feedback from it since it was in the paper? Uh, look, I've had a number of people uh, come to me um, uh, and uh, are pretty supportive, in fact, very supportive. And if you look at perhaps what happened on the day that article came out, it sat on the front section of the Geelong ad, uh, advertiser's uh, a web browse, and that yes. tends to happen when you're getting lots of hits. So I think it's attracted a fair bit of attention, and I got a bit of you know flack from some people in my you know, sort of more conservative camp who think I'm attacking the liberal side. Well, guess what? I am because I'm providing an alternative to the status quo, and whether it's liberal or labour. It has to change because this current system of pork where Karangamite, because it's marginal, gets all the money, but Karaya, where Richard Miles sits, gets nothing, or Wannan, where Dan Tian sits, gets nothing, is just not on. And we have distortions all over the place. And this goes back to the sports rorts and the car park, car park rorts that have been in the press most recently. The system is deeply flawed. And a big part of my agenda and the reason why I'm standing is to provide an alternative voice on the centre, centre right and to try to push and agitate for change in the current system. Libby Coker uh, and, and Stephanie Asher 
and then you can read into that Sarah Henderson and Richard Miles waving their hands and promising the world in Karangamite. In fact, Karangamite should be called Pork Central, the amount of billions of dollars that were thrown at it in the 19 campaign, and no doubt the billions will be thrown at it uh, in the 22 campaign. It's just fundamentally wrong. Yes, for individuals in Karangamite, including me as a wannabe politician, will say, this is wonderful, look what I can do, I can promise all sorts of things. But as a system, and for the way that our wider region operates and interrelates with each other and the way that we can build our city and create jobs for our children is profoundly wrong because what happens is it cuts right across the growth agenda and the decentralization agenda. We can't grow properly. We can't grow Karangamite properly. It can't interrelate properly with Karayo and Wannan to create a city of the future for our children. And this is just wrong, Mitchell. Well, thanks so much for being on the program and uh, we look forward to speaking to you again next month. It's starting to hot up there in Karangamite now because I see the Greens have now pre-selected their candidate as well. So uh, interesting times ahead. Indeed, look, we want competition and a contest of ideas. So this is very much part of it. This is about a, a robust democracy, but we do need to push for change, and that's what I'm about. Thank you very much, Tom Rowe, the independent candidate running for Karangamite in the upcoming federal election. The Mitchell's Front Page Podcast is brought to you by Geelong Bank. Listen live on 94.7 The Pulse, Mondays and Tuesdays from 9 to 11. Or search for Mitchell's Front Page on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or wherever you get your podcasts.